Hello and welcome back to the Pretty Serious Bike Racing Podcast. It's Monday after the Tour de France Femme. It's it's the Monday after about a month of quality racing in France. And yet we've got all kinds of racing still going on all over the world. We've got the World Championships coming up. There is so much to talk about in a pretty serious fashion. I am Dane Cash, and I'm excited to be joined. As ever, I am excited to be able to have my conversation, my weekly chat, with Cosmo Catalano, bike racing analyst extraordinaire. Cosmo, welcome back. Thanks, Dane. Good to be back. Although, I feel like there's a lot that we have to talk about that I don't know as much about because there was so much racing going on. Well, you have between now and when I throw to you in a few minutes to you know be an analyst to look things up, which should be ample time, right? You got you got you to watch. You got to you got to you can't just chug it. You got to savor the bouquet. You got to get a little. I got you. Let's see what the. I don't yeah, know yeah, what the, it's the called bouquet, when you look at for wine, sure. whether or not it's smooth or hazy or clear or whatever. Uh, also joining us for the second straight week, which is very exciting news because we we went so many weeks without hearing from you ruth uh ruth winder welcome back to the pretty serious bike racing podcast thanks for having me again of course uh we are here to talk tour de france fam we are here to talk classica san sebastian there's the tour de pologne going on right now i mean literally right now that the third stage of the tour of poland is ending uh oh it just ended rafael micah won the third stage of the tour of poland ahead of mate mohoric this just happened uh, we've got Worlds coming up. There is a lot of bike racing going on at this time. It's, uh, I, was, I was texting someone about this, how this is a funny sport where in the middle of the season we get the Tour de France and then there's still all kinds of action right after that, particularly when Worlds gets kind of moved to August. We've got lots to talk about, as we do every week, really. I mean, that's, that's kind of the nature of the sport. And if you like hearing us talk about bike racing, I'll tell you right now, before we get any farther into the show, you should head on over to escapecollective.com slash join and sign up. Become a member of the very cool Escape Collective community that supports this podcast, Wheel Talk, Placeholders, Geek Warning. Uh, we'd love to have you as a member. And you should go check it out if you haven't already. If you have, if you already are a member, we, we are so grateful for that. And uh, we appreciate you. Yeah. All right. On with the show. So we've got Tour de France Femme, I think, is going to be our main topic of discussion today. Before we delve into that, though, I do want to just kind of start with some news. There's a pretty horrible news to touch on here before we do that. Uh, horrible news out of the junior cycling scene here in Boulder, where Magnus White, who was 17 years old, uh, was killed this weekend when a driver hit him while he was training uh, literally a few hundred meters away from from where I'm recording right now. Uh, really awful. Uh, junior racer, multi-discipline talent, and he was about to head to Worlds, which, yeah, like I said, we're going to talk about Worlds, and he was going to be going there, um, mountain bike talent among the juniors. Um, so awful news that, that that just happened, and uh, our our thoughts are with uh, everyone here in the Boulder cycling community, the you know, Boulder Junior Cycling, and really anyone affected by by this, it's uh, pretty tragic news. Obviously, when this happens to anyone, but particularly for a 17-year-old, um, and uh, yeah, so our thoughts are with everyone. Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about the bike race. We're going to talk about Tour de France Femme. We're going to talk about uh, all the bike racing. So let's start with the race that just ended. Overall impressions. Tour de France Femme, Demi Vollering was the pre-race favorite, and Demi Vollering was the very clear winner at the end. The podium was a little bit of a surprise in that it did not feature Annemiek van Vleuten, who was the kind of other favorite besides Demi Vollering. Lada Kopecky of SD Works just narrowly pipping Cassia Nuviadoma for runner-up honors. Nuviadoma settling on a tie third. Breaker. Right? Didn't they have the same official time? Yes. On tenths of a second, it was decided, uh, which is probably pretty frustrating for Nuvia Doma. But nonetheless, she did finish on the podium, and I don't think, I didn't, you know, I think she probably was happy about that. So, at the end of the race, Demi Vollering, your clear winner. I think there were all kinds of great stage battles, though. Lots of interesting talking points throughout the race. Overall impressions. Cosmo, Ruth, what did you think? I loved it. I, I was, this is, it's been, 
I think slower than necessary, the launch of this event, but I think it really stood on its own two feet in a way that it hasn't before this time around. Not that last year's race was, you know, they, they had the, they shared the starting stage with the finish of the men's tour de France. This was a entirely separate event in an entirely separate place. And I think you saw better crowd support. I think you saw better racing. I think this, the very, very top of the GC was not super hotly contested. I think it was pretty clear who the strongest was, but the podium and the battles for top five, six were wild throughout the race. I think you saw the sort of uh, early aggression and uh, chance taking in the first couple stages that you, you really only kind of see in those chaotic days of the, uh, of, the, of the men's Tour de France. And I thought it was just, yeah, really delivered on all fronts in a way um, that uh, I've been wanting to see it deliver it probably for a decade plus. So um, good to see it out there and love to see the support it got. Definitely the support they had was so cool. The crowds to see that for a women's race, like you rarely, rarely, rarely ever see that. And that was just so awesome to be able to see that for, for everybody out there racing. Yeah, that was great. And I think the fact that they got that level of support where this race occurred was, I don't want to say a surprise, but very cool. I mean, they're, they're in this place that, well, first of all, the, you know, the men's race had been through there and spent a fair amount of time there and the fans were still out in force that was awesome to see that throughout throughout the race uh, and i think it really added to the to the entertainment value uh all right let's talk about some moments that stood out during this race uh cosmo i want to throw to you first because i know that one of those h- happened early on in the race and i'd like to keep things chronological so yeah, uh, I, yeah. i touched on it earlier here. but uh, the aggression in the in the in the front of the race in the early stages was really cool. Um, it wasn't just you know a break gets away and we wait for S Day Works or probably usually Day S M instead of S Day Works to chase it. It was like we're going to go out there and we're going to shake things up. We're going to grab mountain points. We're going to take the stage. We're going to do whatever we can do. We're not sitting here and and waiting for the race to come to us. And it was just you know it was Phoenix could have won. Nothing. They could have not had the mountain jersey. They could have not won a stage, and they still would have been out there looking awesome. Like there was a particular moment. I think it was stage two, maybe, uh, where uh, Eva von Ucht was kind of shaking her head because the Phoenix riders just keeps keeps on attacking, almost like on pure stoke. And as for me, I was very much like, I don't know. I think that's the move. I think this is just you know, you're out there. You're on the stage. This is your moment. Like. Let her rip and see what happens, because uh, you know there's some super strong teams riding really well. They're probably going to bring it back. Like, make it happen when you can make it happen, and, and Phoenix really did. And it was it was cool to hear their interviews with their DS afterwards, saying, "Hey, yeah, that's the plan. Like, that's what we're going to do." Um, and yeah, I love that. I think it's cool to see. You know, like they have to kind of do that, right? We have these bigger teams, and like you said, they're probably going to come back. And most of the time, they would have come back and the fact that we had so many breakaways stay to the line this time or almost stay to the line is pretty rare and unusual I would say but there's always a team or two that's just like constantly never ever ever ending attacking and so eventually the peloton's just like oh my gosh I give up fine go like be gone I don't want to see you anymore and the fact that it really worked out for them is cool it's not like some epic tactic that we need to analyze it's just that they kept trying and the peloton got fed up with it and then the peloton failed in bringing in bringing them back sometimes um when those teams were doing these attacks that just wouldn't let up and it's because they know they don't have another option because if they do wait to the line or they do wait to the climb or the sprint or whatever they know their best chance is maybe 15th or something so um they just they just have to race that way otherwise they just choose not to race and i don't think anybody wanted to come to such a big stage like that and choose not to race i i think the uh, sort of taking us out of order here on our on our you know sacred run sheet but uh, <laughs> I, I did want to mention at some point that i think sd works really playing the long game uh had a big impact on the way that this race played out i think they did a great job with the early stages they really they made other teams do work at times to, to a point where it was even, I think, uh, a major talking point with, uh, you know, the question marks around, okay, will DSM actually, you know, we, we had a story up on Escape Collective, will they, will they call the, the SD Works bluff? And I think for SD Works, I mean, the team, they ended up at this race uh, with 
with two riders on the podium. They ended up with multiple stage wins. They took the points jersey. They, they, they clearly came to this race and achieved their objectives. They won a lot at this race. But they also, I think, made the, the conscious decision at, at various points to, to put the, the onus on other teams to do some chasing. And it actually, for particularly in the kind of middle second half of the race, there were once and then again and then again and again, you kept having these breakaway stage winners that was on stages that we really did not expect to see those things. And I think SD Works deciding to let other teams, you know, try to call their bluff, uh, it generally ended up in, in the breakaways winning. And for me, I think SD Works is probably fine with that. It's a, it's a long-term game for them where they say, yeah, we're going to let some Tour de France stages go. That's fine. We still crushed the Tour de France. We, we took second and first. We won a bunch of stages. We w- took a bunch of jerseys. And in the end, other teams, I think, are going to have to realize, wow, we, SD Works really is willing to throw away those wins. And we're going to have to do that work. I don't, I don't think that's going to earn SD Works any friends. We're going to we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. But in general, I think they're playing the long game here. They're willing to throw tour stages, multiple tour stages away, if need be, to keep up this, this strategy of, yeah, we, we'll let you do the work. That sounds fine. And then we'll, we'll finally take over in the end. If we lose the stage, we lose the stage. Whatever, we're going to win the whole thing. So who cares? And I was very, I was sort of impressed by that. It's, it's easy to, um, easy to see that as a, as a negative thing, but I think it's, I mean, it's bike racing. So, yeah. I would say that Kopecky seemed a little, a little upset sometimes when she didn't win the stage. So completely and a hundred percent, totally. Okay. With all of the loss is maybe not true, but maybe, maybe Danny after, Stam though. Like, okay, Danny maybe. Stam might be fine with it, but maybe. his riders may be less so. Maybe. <laughs> uh, Ruth, in the past, on this very podcast, um, we, i.e., you, have uh, have been somewhat critical of of a certain rider who sometimes makes attacks that are unsuccessful. Uh, what did you see from Cassia Nuviadoma in this race, and and that, do you think that she? you know, maybe was a little bit more tactical. I think we saw her do a little bit of her trait, her personal trait of attacking, and nobody's really sure why. Earlier in the week, there was definitely a few times when I was just like, Kasia, everybody is on your wheel, everybody. You're just going hard with everybody behind you, and she wasn't making up any ground, and it seemed like she was just making herself tired. And the only reason I get so... I don't know, on her about it is because I think she has such an ability to do well and it's so fun to watch her race. But then we did, I think, really see that on the last, oh, not the last stage, but the last road stage up the Tourmalet where she she just rode really within herself. On the descent, I don't even know that she attacked, which is when she got her gap. Um, She just is a demon descender. I've descended with her multiple times in races in the past and Sometimes you're just like, oh gosh, hold on for dear life. And I'm lucky that I'm a good descender too and have been able to descend with her. But I know if you're not that confident um, that it's really hard to hold her wheel. So I think she was just doing her thing. And then the whole time she was just climbing within herself and, and just looked amazing. And when, yeah, she looked like she was suffering for sure. Like she didn't look like she was going easy. Um, but she just was able to hold this pace the whole way. And I think when you're able to dictate that yourself, it's easier than when you're having it dictated by somebody else. And I thought that was just really impressive the way that she rode herself um, into second place on the day and her third place in GC overall was, was really, really good and awesome to see. I thought she had one of the most like I'm trying to think of the adjective I want to use. It was just very just like pure and refreshing kind of interview after that, after stage seven, where she was just like sitting on the ground in a semi-exhausted state being like, you know, it was super hard. Like we knew where I were, you knew, we knew where I was weak. We worked on it, focusing on the stage for, you know, months when Anna Meek stood up, you know, they made that first move on Aspen. She's like, this is where I would normally get, get dropped. I just have to fight through it. And it was just the, the planning and the work that went into that um, and having it work out so well for her i thought was really cool um i think a lot of that you just assume riders train and they're good and they do what they do and it's just to have that kind of look into we were planning for this this was our goal i executed on it and it worked um i don't know i felt a lot of like kind of shared relief just watching that also she dropped a lot of f-bombs then apologized for dropping f-bombs and she was like english isn't my first language it's like we know and i'm also pretty sure you you know what that word means it was it was funny (laughs) it was it was good it was i it was a pure 
the word keep the word I keep coming up with is pure, and it's not quite right. But there's just a wholesomeness to it that I was like, yeah, this is good. Just honest, probably raw, mm. raw and honest, mm-hmm. unfiltered. Mm. Uh, we've talked about the now we've talked about the writer who finished third. We've talked about the writers who finished first and second. Uh, Annemiek van Vleuten, winner of the Giro, came to this race as the kind of the second favorite behind Demi Vollering and didn't finish on the podium. What do we make of that? I mean, is it fatigue? Is it, I mean, a rider who is 40 years old, finally actually maybe riding like someone that is maybe not 40, but 30, 35 years old, because she's still a heck of a good rider. That's for sure. Uh, it seemed, it seemed to me that, that the form just maybe wasn't quite there. I mean, she didn't deliver the, the TT ride that I think everybody expected. So it's not like it wasn't like there was a, a huge tactical mistake or something at some point in this race. She just seemed like she maybe didn't have quite the level required to take on SD Works. I was honestly pretty surprised. I thought she would come out and still kill everybody on the last climb. I was like, oh, we haven't seen much of her. She looks kind of terrible some of the days, but she always looks kind of terrible on her bike. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and then, yeah, on that last that climb up, um, up the cold Aspen, I think it was already, she wasn't looking... Well, looking so hot and then yeah she just kind of fell apart and I don't know what it is who knows what it is she's also still like just we said just did really well at the Giro and everything so I fully expected her to come out and just kind of crush everybody but that's just not what happened I, th- I think I was most impressed by the fact that she rode like she was going to crush everybody like she was very the the way they put Leopard on the front leading in or ha- about halfway up Col d'Espin and just just smashed it and rode it as hard as she could ride it and tried to make it the hardest she could make it. And I mean, she, she said afterwards, I wrote it like I was going to have my best day and win the race this way. And I didn't have my best day. And that was that. Um, and I just, that, that level of confidence in herself, I think is, 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 it speaks a lot to the career she's had and also maybe suggests, you know, she doesn't really have another card to play. She's always been the strongest. She's always been the most powerful. And when something happens, like she rides really hard and the second, her, her closest rival for the, the, the overall title doesn't want to ride hard. It's like, nope, I'm not playing this game. You can you can pull me back up or we can sit here and wait for everyone else, but I'm not. I've got my game plan. I'm sticking to it. Uh, and she really didn't seem to have an answer to that. Um, yeah. When Demi Volering was penalized 20 seconds for drafting, uh, at, at that time, it seemed like, oh, man, 20 seconds. That's a long time uh, to lose in a big stage race. But it wasn't. She still won by three minutes. It really wasn't that close. And uh, yeah, uh, Van Vleuten just didn't have it. We had quite a fair bit, I feel like, of drama um, just with yeah, SD Works and losing uh, DS in 20 seconds. And then uh, Lata Hintala also getting disqualified from the race. Um, I don't think there was any video footage of her incident. It was claimed that she was holding on to the car but then she said in a post that she did not hold on to the car and it was just 10 plus seconds of a sticky bottle which is kind of a long time um it just seemed like the penalties were pretty high uh for the actions in my opinion um to disqualify ds's it's i don't know maybe it's the women's peloton getting more used to being on such a big stage i'm not sure but in the past this was extremely common practice i have been in the caravan just being passed by riders holding onto cars and pushing off windshields and just doing whatever they need to do to get back to the front and it, i was just like what they're disqualifying people for this like i thought it was fine i thought you could draft on a car and zach's like no ruth it's against the rules and i'm like oh i didn't know that <laughs> because it just everybody everybody does it and of course i do like i do really know it but i just thought it was one of those like rules I'm doing quotations, rules that it's so sure it's a rule, but nobody really follows the rule because people just, I guess, have an understanding. If you flat or something happens, you know, you just use the cars and you get back on. So it all seemed very dramatic to me. It did. It did seem to me that uh, Danny Stam, the SD Works director, getting tossed was. I, I he he. Uh, I don't think he did himself any favors by uh, voicing his <laughs> displeasure with the. Commissaires, I, I think they tossed him not just for driving, you know, in a dangerous way, but also probably for kind of being uh, outspoken with his comments. On the, uh, the flip side of this is it makes you realize um, in cycling, you know, it's big news when Danny Stan gets tossed out of a 
have a race. But like the other sport I watch the most, like managers get tossed all the time. So maybe baseball is weird. I don't know. But people get tossed a lot. And in, and in this sport, if you get thrown out of a race, it's a big deal. It's a problem. So uh, I, I guess I to me, it just seems more normal than it probably is. In baseball, I feel like there's a there's a well established choreography for getting yes. kicked out, though, right? Like this was very much a normal thing, and then a motorcycle came whizzing by, gesticulating wildly at the Este Works car. Uh, and I, Abby Mickey Ruth was saying the exact same thing. Like this is stuff that not only happens all the time in the women's peloton, it happens in the men's peloton, and no one gets, generally speaking, unless it's egregious or caught on, you know, gets a million retweets. Nobody cares that much about it. Um, so it, it was, I kind of wonder what point they were trying to make. Um, and I'm personally pretty glad that Danny Stam decided to be outspoken about it because clearly there was not a tremendous amount of impact to his team's performance based on his ejection. So I think the more pushback, public pushback there is, the better. Uh, all right, let's talk moments that maybe pass under the radar uh, because, you know, we've got, we've got these analysts here. Uh, folks, listeners, I, I've got I've got Cosmo and Ruth. I might as well get their informed takes while they're here. Uh, Ruth, I'll start with you because you wrote something in the run sheet that I want you to expound on. I just it's feel tough like... to answer this question is what you wrote, and I want to know why. Why is it tough to answer the question about the you know moments that went under the radar? I think it's tougher just because we had so many unexpected winners almost and so everybody was already looking at what people weren't doing and what people were doing so necessarily like under the radar is harder because everyone was already kind of analyzing oh why didn't sd works work more like why are other teams working more they shouldn't work they should let sd works work and then we have these riders that were just throwing themselves off the front of the race winning um and so i just felt like it was harder to necessarily isolate specific moments that went a little bit unnoticed i would just say you know i still think that the first day when sd works um really raced super well as a team and they put damie on the front for everyone to watch her and then had kopecky win i just i'm not sure that people notice that like by having her on the front it distracted everybody from the other teammates but besides that i felt really <laughs> i felt like i was having a hard time pick specific moments for it just to recap, in terms of those kind of unexpected winners, stages four, five, and six went to, yeah, unexpected attackers who stayed away. Yara Castellan, Ricardo Bauernfeind, and Emma Norsgaard staying away on all those stages. So lots of breakaway uh, success, lots of solo wins that kind of managed to fend off the chasers. Uh, Cosmo? I was going to say the, the big GC showdown on stage seven. Um I mean, it's obvious when the two riders are not pedaling and talking to each other and hitting their brakes for no reason that something is amiss. But I remember when Lippert lined the field out, like with Van Vloten, second wheel, uh, Vollering was like seven wheels down, hanging out with Royster. Like, they're kind of looking, I think they were kind of talking, like, do we want to move up? And she's just like, no, like, I don't want to. Like, traditionally, when that, your opponent does that, you're like, oh, it's going to be fast. I'm going to get up front so it's easy to respond. And uh, Van Vloten attacked and... You could see Vollering come up, and I think once she got out of the saddle just to get around um, Nibiodoma, and then just sat there the whole time. And after probably 30 seconds of pulling, Van Vloten was kind of waving her elbow, like, come on, let's go, let's go. And Vollering's just sitting there the whole time. And you saw Akasia occasionally would come around to take a pull. Vollering never came there. Like, I think the whole time she was just like, I'm sitting on my wheel and doing nothing until you make me do something or until the point where I'm planning to attack. Uh, and just that... I mean, for me, that was just like a huge prolonged stare down of which the actual stare down was was only one point. Um, it just it seemed very atypical to what we saw, especially between uh, Vinigo and Pagachar at, at the men's tour, because they were, you know, always on each other. It was very it was an interesting contrast. Unheralded riders, Cosmo, here's your chance to herald. Juliette Labus. Come on. She was she was doing all the grunt work during this, like what is going on kind of stare down. There's a group and no one else is really feels like they can chase the, the lead three. And she eventually just comes to the front and grinds out what she can grind out. And it's 
a lot of work and you're kind of like, what are you doing? Like you're just towing everybody until you look at the GC and realize she the two people in front of her. And I think the two closest people behind her had not made the selection of the group she was in. So she just kept grinding and grinding and grinding when it got, when no one else wanted to help, she tried to attack, tried to get away solo. Um, when, uh, when Volering, when they, when they regrouped and headed up the Tourmalet again, she kind of found herself on the front. Um, when the, when the big attack went from Volering, she actually got dropped a little bit. Um, and even Kopecky went by her and she just worked her way right back up. Uh, I think came up to fifth or sixth, um, and like with a, almost a minute on either side of her. So really kind of secured her place in the GC and then got past Mulman Passy on the TT. And it was just like a really good hard nothing too tricky about it just you know suffer through the day give your rivals give the rest of the group a little bit of advantage knowing that the rivals you're closest to are all getting hurt by it um it was it was really cool i like to see that kind of writing so i totally agree she was super impressive um it was when she was throwing out all her attacks i was like ah oh, don't do too much but then it seemed like the last couple of k's of the climb she totally came back and had yeah just this effort left left to give she just had to do her thing and kind of ignore everybody a little bit at some point um but yeah she's been slowly getting so much stronger i was teammates with her a couple years ago and just like has such a strong work ethic and yeah it's really fun to see her just do her thing and finish fifth is amazing like such a cool result all right i do want to rate the tour but first what did we learn uh, what did we learn from this tour about uh, mainly sd works i think is 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 what we can draw a lot of conclusions about uh Maybe their tactics, uh, yeah, results just in general. What do we learn? I think they seem to just, they seem to have a general plan, but it also seems like they just let the strongest rider do their thing. I do think that we saw them have some tactics some days, and then it seemed like we'll just let, you know, Kopecky go do her thing, or let Demi go, Volerin go and do her thing. But definitely on the Tomale the last day, I do think it was the tactic that they waited for Roysa to close that gap to do the work. Like, Vollering had no reason to do anything hard when she had the two teammates she had behind her. And I think that was cool to kind of see this balance between a team that, like, everybody seems to really want to win, but then also a team that did work together at the same time. I have to imagine that letting the strongest rider win often is part of what keeps this team more or less running smoothly. Sometimes it does it, but generally, I mean, they've been running more or less smoothly for a decade now. It's hard to argue with your director's decisions on who gets to be the leader or whatnot when it's just the strongest rider. And this is a team full of strong riders, but if they just say, hey, strongest rider goes today, and sometimes that leads to intra-team drama like we saw at Strata. If you have that mentality, if you have that approach, it is kind of hard to take too much issue with things when that's the, the normal approach. And, and it seems to work pretty darn well. It was interesting to see on, I think it was stage three when Lippert won. It was interesting to see how they did their, you know, they had Volering lead out Kopecky and Kopecky didn't win. And that affected nothing for the rest of the race. Like everything still went according to plan. It wasn't like, oh, Kopecky, you blew it. Or like, why did we waste all this effort trying to get you across the line first or et cetera? Um, I don't think her tire was that flat. I saw people pushing on the tire at the end of the stage and it didn't look flat enough that I, I mean, maybe you would notice in a sprint. I don't know. It didn't look very flat. Um, anyway, uh, I, I just thought it was, you know, that it's easy when you're always winning to be like, yeah, we're just going to follow the plan. Um, and it, you win and you're like, yay. But when things don't go right and you still follow the plan, you still execute and you still win, that's really where you see what teams work and what teams don't. And uh, I will say, I think we saw the Peloton get a little fed up with, with, with SD Works at a few points uh, during the race. And I love a lot of their riders and the way they ride. I think they're all super strong and a great team unit. But at the same time, they... They do visually look to be a little bossy in the peloton, especially in small groups at the front. And I think maybe some of that caught up with them on the days they didn't win. To me, I mean, individually, the riders on this team all are pretty likable, I think. They're, they're pretty easy to root for. There's no one who stands out as like an obvious, ugh, easy to root against that person. Uh, but as a, as a unit, they definitely, it, to me, it felt like this was the a possible heel turn for them in the race. I mean, they 
They are the dominant force in cycling for years. It's been Annemiek van Vleuten and SD Works year in, year out for a long time. And there's plenty of reasons to sort of get tired of seeing them win all the time, just because we like to see multiple people in contention. It makes racing more entertaining. But for me, this was the race where I, I finally, I think that there are some fans who might, from this point on, actually kind of root against them just because of that way they rode. And yet, yeah, Danny Stam getting thrown out of the race for driving a certain way and probably complaining too much. And they did a lot of, you know, complaining just in general about this or that thing. You saw some some complaints about this or that thing. And yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of wondering, yes, they crushed everybody in this race. Yes, they won. But is this is this the race where they go from just being that dominant team that people are kind of tired of seeing win to maybe being a team that people actually root against? Again, even though individually... I don't know. I mean, it, it's to me, it's it's hard to root against Marlon Rooser, or, for instance. Like, uh, really, any a lot of Kopecky, the Demi Volering, the, the individuals on this team, they seem delightful. But as a unit, they certainly did seem to really kind of not make any friends uh, at, at at this race. I think it's hard not to like them a little bit. I think although they win a lot, they're still winning in really cool ways. I mean, you can't argue that the last day of the Tomale wasn't exciting. They did a really good job as a team. I think some of the earlier days in the week, it was questionable if they had a tactic or they were just like out racing and trying to win. And if they won the day, great. And if they didn't, then it didn't really matter because they were going to win the GC. Um but it's hard for me not to like them. I think personally in the Peloton, it's hard to know how they're liked. Like when you have a rider that rides around cocky, I think there's a huge difference between being confident and um, sure of yourself and being cocky. And I think that Anna Vanderbregen did a very good job of being an extremely confident respected rider and it's a really hard line to ride as somebody that good in the peloton but if you come across as arrogant or like people are just in your way and they're annoying or they're not doing something that they should be like why aren't other teams working you should be working and what to help you win like why would people respect you in the peloton if that's how you're going to treat them so I think that there's just like a really fine line as the best athletes in the peloton have to ride to get that level of respect and i think you know yeah vanderbregen did a great job of being a very respected rider um voss has always been a very respected rider um just just to name a few that i can think of but i'm not gonna i don't know what it's like to be that but i would assume that it's a little challenging to to find that but you just if you make the peloton feel like they're just annoying you then they're gonna get annoyed at you and they're not gonna give you the space or the respect that you think you deserve because in reality you have to earn it you don't just get it you don't just get it given to you so i think it, it can just be interesting from inside the peloton from that point of view yeah that's something that we don't necessarily get very often we, we don't we don't know what's going on um all right out of five although as I wrote here, you guys like your decimals, so maybe we should be rating out of 100. No? Well, I'm going to push back <laughs> on the 1 to 5 to decimals because an 80, which is a 4, is a B-, minus, but on a scale of 5, it's the next highest score you can get. Yeah. So that's... You that Make that hard that decisions, you know? It, no, this is, this is a they're completely incomparable. They're, you, in your, you're like, oh, this is mathematically equivalent, and it's like, no, that's just not how it works. All right, I give this tour a 3 out of 5 because I think the tour was fine. And yes, if it's a letter grade, it's a 60, and that's bad, but it's not a letter grade. It's a 3 out of 5, which if it's a film, I'm willing to go see a three-star movie. I thought this was a fun tour. Uh, the GC battle was underwhelming in the end, but the individual stages were constantly entertaining thanks to, yeah, we had some good sprints, but then we also had... Lots of great action from, as I said before, Yara Castellan and Ricardo Bauernfeind. Emma Norsgaard just barely holding on. I mean, th those were really entertaining days. And then even the, the, the stages where Demi Vollering, well, even the Tourmalet where Demi Vollering ultimately crushed everybody it was still pretty entertaining to watch uh, riders riding through the mist on that day. So for me, it's a three out of five. Uh, Ruth, what do you say? If I'm not allowed to des use decimals, I no, would no, go... No, no, use as... I want you to be as granular as you want. That's just the <laughs> difference between a three and a four. I went with a three and a half. Um, if I had to pick, I'd go four. I think that 
the courses could have like the way the GC was it would have been fun to have like maybe one bigger climby day earlier in the race it would have been fun to not end on a time trial I think in terms of that but yeah I think the way that it was raced the support that we saw just to have the excitement for women in the sport and just be there to watch it and experience it from afar what it means um not just for cycling but just like general women in sport I think I can't rate it lower just for emotional reasons like that and yeah I think um from the day-to-day racing itself we did have some really exciting finishes I think there were times where I would have loved to see a bunch sprint so just like a little bit different if it had been raced a little bit different in terms of tactics that would have also been okay so I had my downsides but overall I enjoyed watching it and will watch again (laughs) I'll definitely watch again, for sure, yes. I mean, I think I would watch again even if it were a one, right? I mean, Yes, definitely. Watch again, and we hope it would be a, at least a two the next <laughs> that year. That was a silly thing to say. <laughs> Cosmo, I think you you made a fine point about your letter grade, and okay. it's the same number that you, yeah, I mean, you, you said it's an 80, right? So go ahead, it, it's a four, it, right? I, I gave it a four. I thought I liked, I thought it was really good. I am not willing to say the GC battle was boring when second place was decided by less than a second. Um, I, the only thing I would have liked to see is maybe some crosswinds or some, some sort of deception. I think the, this, the, the Vuelta Femenina was still better because of all the kind of chaos and, and drama surrounding it. Um, but you know, you can't replicate the tour outside the tour. Um, but no, I, I was very satisfied with this. I, I would love to see another stage like we saw on, uh, the gravel last year, but I'm, you know, you can't have those every, every tour. Um, again, early mountains, I think would be cool or mountains after the TT would be cool. Maybe a few more days in this race, make it like a 10 day race. Yeah. But that's a, another discussion for another time. I, I was, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. I think that, I mean, what we maybe need the most is just for a rider to come along and be able to challenge Damien Volary. All right. That's the Tour de France Femme, Avex Zwift. Let's talk San Sebastian real quick, uh, where Remco Evenepoel took his third win in the race. He took his first one when he was 19 years old, which is kind of, I mean, he's still so young. So it's wild that he already has three San Sebastian wins. He did this one with a sort of very characteristic long range attack, although he was not so low. He did have a little bit of company this time. He went, it was like 70K. He went clear of the pack to go meet up with the survivors of the break. Uh, he had Peo Bilbao. He had uh, Alberto Betiol. They had Alexander Vlasov up there. Uh, at the end of the day, it was Bill Bow and Evanapol up the road, fighting for the win amongst themselves. Evanapol, the well, at that point, the two-time winner, go on to be the two-time winner, and Peo Bill Bow, the kid from the Basque Country who grew up not very far from San Sebastian. Uh, unfortunately for Bill Bow, he was beaten by Evanapol in the sprint. I was impressed by Evanapol's sprint. Ruth, based on what I'm reading here, you're less impressed by Evanapol in the sprint. Well, you just said now he can sprint, and I just thought you just beat one person when you stood out of your saddle and sprinted. I don't know that it like makes you the best sprinter. I'm not saying he can't sprint. I just didn't know if it was like necessarily a worthwhile note to make. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, I'm not saying he is the best sprinter. No, uh, but you know, I think Pale Bilbao's got a little bit of speed on him, so I think it was impressive. He, he's Pale Bilbao's got some explosiveness to him, so I was impressed with Remco for being able to win that one. I think uh, that Remco's white skin suit alone would have beaten him in the sprint. <laughs> white, white shorts appreciator. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a little white shorts action, you know? It's, it's Risky move to wear the white shorts in the Basque country. <laughs> you know, one of the rainiest places around. Yeah, well, we all know after Liège, best on Liège, that he's not scared of that. No, he's not. Yeah, it's it's a, <laughs> definitely a conscious decision of what he's doing. Uh, all right. I want to say real quick about Evanapool that immediately after the race, the questions about Evanapool were... You know, all right, what does this mean for your future form? And I get that. Uh, if I were at San Sebastian, I'm sure I would have been there for that, you know, question, and I would have wanted to know what he had to say. But I just really quickly wanted to mention that being a three-time Cl- Classica San Sebastian winner, being a two-time Monument winner and a world champion, is that's a really big deal. And Remco Evanapool is a really good one-day racer, and I kind of feel for him that the fact that he's also a Vuelta winner and the fact that he's also sort of seen as maybe a rider who can challenge Vingago and Pogacar 
in the Grand Tours. I don't know that that's true, but he's seen as someone who is maybe a potential Grand Tour challenger to their dominance. I think it means that people underappreciate his incredible success at a very young age in these one-day races. And if if a rider was not a Grand Tour talent and had already amassed the one-day Palmares that Remco Evenepoel has with all those wins, three classic San Sebastian at his age, I think we would talk about them. I think we would say uh, just more, you know, would give them more praise. But instead, I think it's all, so much focus is put on the other races on his calendar. I just kind of want to take a quick moment to say, you know what? Congrats, Remco, because the three San Sebastians is a heck of a a heck of a thing to pull off. In addition to your two back-to-back Liège titles and your World Championship win, uh, I think one day racing is really cool, and we don't need to always focus on the Grand Tours. So nice job, Remco. Also, I really feel for Pale Bilbao, like racing probably all his friends are on the side of the road his family's there it was so close to this big win and I, okay yes he did just win a tour stage so he's probably riding high right now probably enjoying life but this close to being able to win at san sebastian was probably a bit of a bummer you know what would improve appreciation of classic san sebastian it's not having it during the tour de france yeah and also You're not the wrong. tour of poland <laughs> and yes uh, that's true just I mean, you know, they don't put Roubaix in the middle of the Giro. Don't don't put San Sebastian in the middle of the Tour de France. Yes, it's the women's Tour de France, but it's still the Tour de France. Like, yeah, and we're still busy covering it. So, like, yeah. we, we have to – there's only, you know, there's only one spot for the main story on the homepage. And, you know, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I definitely think it's the time of year because the spring, everybody's all about one days. And now everyone's That's true. just all about the toll. So. It really happens with the Lombardia as well where it's people – care less about it which is a bummer because it's they got to move it back to cross season where it was from before that's just are you saying that would make people like it more i don't know i i, I have no idea actually uh, i think the road season is probably too long running from january to october but that's another again these are bigger picture things these are things that the placeholders can talk about i know kaylee yes. feels extremely strongly about this too so we should give him you know his space to to vent on the length of the calendar all right lastly the tour of poland is going on we don't need to get too deep into it, but thus far, I have been very impressed by Matej Mohoric, who has been climbing quite well. He climbed to victory on stage two, which was a pretty steep finishing climb. And I got to say, I was not expecting Matej Mohoric to be able to win a stage that ended with a 9.5% climb uh, ahead of Joao Almeida, Mikov Kwiatkowski. You know, riders you expect to be climbing up steep, punchy ascents. So good on Matej Mohoric, who as of the third stage when we were mid-recording, Rafael Micah just won, but uh, Matej Mohoric is your GC leader at the moment. And I'm kind of curious how the riders who are coming out of the Tour of Poland will do at Worlds coming up so soon. Uh, yeah, interesting decisions there by all these, by all these riders. Uh, but yeah, good on Mohoric. Had a heck of a season so far. All right, I think we have been pretty serious enough about bike racing today. And we will be somehow discussing the men's world road race next show, which is very strange. But that's what happens when the UCI decides to do a once every four years combined worlds and they move it up to August. And I'm sure there will be plenty of time to preview worlds over on the placeholders. We're going to do all kinds of pre-worlds stuff over at escapecollective.com. So rather than spending too much time doing that here, just know that worlds is coming up. And you'll be able to watch the likes of Remco Evenepoel and, I think, pre-race favorite Wout van Aert, Matthew van der Poel, all kinds of other riders in the men's race in just one week from now, less than a week from now. So lots to look forward to there. The races are really spread out across the entire event, so it will be the men's road race early on, but then we won't see the... You know, the, the women's time trials two days later, the women's road race as well after that. So it, they're really spread out across this whole, you know, multidisciplinary experience, uh, which will also feature mountain bikes and track bikes and all sorts of entertaining bike racing fare. So lots to look forward to. We'll have all that on the next show. For now, Cosmo, Ruth, thanks for joining me. Hope you enjoyed the show, everybody, and we'll see you next time.